Okay, so welcome to Fave 17. Um, we're here with Quentin Lamy Besnier. Uh, he is a PhD student at Institut Pasteur in the De Belvier lab. Um, they study uh, phage, bacteria, and host, the tripartite interactions. And so um, they've put together this viral host range database. And so we really wanted Quentin to um, come and explain how this works to us because this looks like the exact kind of community tool that we wanna get behind and help make sure lots of people in the community know about it and use it. So I'm um, really excited to have Quentin here to walk through how we use this, what it's for, and who knows, I'm as excited as all of you. So um, please ask your questions in the chat. Um, we'll do the same format we usually do for anyone who's new. Um, a, we'll do a talk and then a Q&A and then we'll do some breakout rooms at the end, depending on how much time we have left in the hour, like five minutes um, of random meetups with about three or four other people, just so you can say hi, meet a new face, um, nothing planned or formal, just um, informal little chat at the end. Um, and those are not gonna be recorded, so you can feel free to be yourself. So um, with that, I think we'll pass it over. Quentin, if you wanna give a better introduction than that for yourself on, um, yeah, where, where did you originally come from? We could, we could start with that um, and then you can take it away. So go for it. Okay, so hello everyone and thank you Jessica for the kind introduction. So I'm Quentin and I'm from France. So uh, I'm also doing my PhD in France now in Paris, uh, in Dr. De Barbier's group, as Jessica said. And yeah, we'll present you now this uh, very old database. So let's get right into it. So I think it's uh, possible for some of you to already have struggled doing some of these things. Uh, for instance, searching the precise host of a page or trying to analyze, compare different or strange experiments, and also um, trying to exploit uh, all strange data on a very large scale. And this is for some of these uh, reasons that we created the viral host, the viral host range database. Uh, but before going further, let's take a step back for a quick introduction, just to make sure we're all on the same page. So as you probably all know here, page usually can infect more than just one host. And what we call the host range of a page is actually just a list of the strains that this page can infect. And I want to stress out that this is a very dynamic value uh, you can test it on 10 strain and get a certain result, but you can also test it always on more strain and it's really an ever changing value. And uh, normally you, you determine this uh, experimentally. So now let's go back to the, this challenge I mentioned uh, just before. So the first one is about uh, finding the host of a phage. And I think you might not expect this, but uh, no, nowadays you're looking for uh, the precise host of a, of a page, for instance, you might think that you, well, you're just gonna open your web browser, Google it, and you're going to find information, but actually it's, it's not the case. Uh, first, if you look at uh, public repositories, um, in the base case scenario, you're going to find uh, species level information. And for instance, if we take the example for T4, uh, I mean, which is a basic, very basic bacterial page that everybody knows, uh, you're going to see that on, on GeneBank, it's just going to say that the host is a bacteria, so that's not super helpful. And uh, the other uh, resource that you're going to want to use in this situation would be publications, of course. But uh, once again, it's much more difficult that you might anticipate to find this sort of data here. Because um, all strange data, most of the time, is not going to be the, the core, the highlight of the article. So it's not going to be reflected. Uh, in the title or in the keyword that you have such data included. So if we take uh, this example from a publication of our lab, um, there is some strange data, as you can see, but if you look at the title, it doesn't say which phage are being tested, which bacteria are also being tested. It doesn't say that there is some strange data, of course. So if you want to access this data, it's going to be very difficult from like PubMed or something. And I also want to add that uh, all strange data is often published in the supplementary as it, as it, as it, oh, sorry, <laughs> as it was in this case, uh, in this article. And sometimes it's also not even published at all. So it's really not easy to find. And I think 
if we would look at the consequence, it means that uh, currently there's no resource to easily find the precise host of the stage. And I think it can be uh, a problem in uh, many situations. Uh, maybe you're starting a new project and you don't have much background about like uh, this bacteria or this new phage you're working about and you want to know more. Or maybe um, you're interested in phage therapy, so you want to know this sort of information as fast as possible. And I think in other cases, it's going to be uh, quite difficult. So the second, the second challenge that I mentioned was about uh, trying to analyze different uh, strange experiments together. And maybe you experienced it, or maybe you don't, but here's this um, example to try to explain to all of you because it might not be so obvious. So here I have three um, different, very small strange experiments. And if you just look at them and try to ask yourself these basic questions, um, are the results reproducible? How many phage did I test? How many bacteria did I test? Which phage has the broadest source range, for instance? Well, if you just take a second to look and try to answer this question, it's not going to be so easy because there's some partial overlap between the data set, etc. And it will be much easier to answer this question if we merge the table. And if you see that now we have just one table that combines all of this data, and we can answer this question very easily. So we can see that here we have uh, two values. So the results are not reproducible for this particular interaction. Uh, we've, test we've tested four phages, six bacteria. And we see that T4 has the broadest host range. So uh, I think it's uh, also a very relevant problem because most people working with phage, I think, will generate some sort of host range data uh, at some point. And this means that uh, there's a lot of data, but when you want to combine it and get an overview, um, so you have to kind of like merge this table together. And this is actually very tedious to do even for such small data set that I showed you. So you can just imagine normally when you do this sort of experiment, you can have easily dozens or hundreds of elements that you are testing against each other, especially now with the development of like automation and all of this. And there's really no simple way to do uh, to merge uh, tables like that. For instance, if you use Excel, you cannot do that easily. You just have to do it by hand, and it's really not uh, easy to do. So I think in the end, what this creates is uh, the fact that it's very difficult to keep track of uh, such data over time. So it might be on your personal scale because you're doing this experiment every now and then, and at some point you want to get an overview. Or I think more importantly, at a laboratory scale, because um, in the labs, there's going to be a number of people with a number of projects, and this can get out of hand uh, very fast. And I'm saying that because that's actually all these projects started for us. It was my boss, Laurent, which knew he had like uh, a lot of data from the different students and postdoc over time. But the problem for him was that uh, if he was wondering, like, okay, did you actually test this page against this particular bacteria? And if he wanted to like know the answer, we would have to go like on all these folders from all these people and open the file one by one and check. And it's really not like convenient if you want to get a quick overview. So I wanted uh, at first a tool to just be able to get an overview of all the data we had in the lab and be able to then use it whenever you want. So I think it's really uh, useful to have like such a place where you can gather and, and manage your data. And the last challenge, um, it's very related to the two previous challenge that I mentioned. It's about um, exploiting or change data, but on a much bigger scale. And I think, uh, as I just showed you, all strange data, most of the time, it's going to be very difficult to access. So if you want a lot of it, you're going to have to spend a lot of time. And I think it's really limiting uh, in terms of knowledge and applications, because uh, all strange data can be variable in a lot of cases, I think. And just a two example, for instance, in phage ecology, uh, I think there's a lot of people trying to figure out like whether phage should be a narrow or wide host range and all of these things. So I think, of course, if you have a lot of host range data, it's going to be super useful. Uh, in phage therapy, as I also said uh, just earlier, I think it's going to be useful to have access to, to, to this sort of data. And I think that in most phage therapy pipeline, you're going to do a test because it's uh, valuable information in this context. And finally, and as in all cases where uh, you're going to have a lot of data, computational approaches will also be super valuable. And for this, we can envision a number of applications uh, also. So I think 
Uh, all strange data is super valuable for the community, but it's mo mostly unavailable, so it's really underexploited. And uh, that is for, for all of these reasons um, that we created the viral all strange database. And the philosophy behind it is just to buy the database uh, to come to try to get all of this experimental all strange data. And what we uh, wanted to do is really uh, create this tool for the community. But uh, keep in mind that it will it is for the community, but also powered by the community because we need people to contribute to their data to make this uh, database grow, of course. We also wanted to allow uh, people to grow this database as easily as possible, and we also uh, wanted to provide some with some tools that can be useful when you're working with such data. But uh, I think that's enough introduction. Now let's go to the website and take a quick tour. So let's go. And now we're on the home page of the Royal Austrian database. And I just mentioned like those three main challenges that I think uh, this website can answer. And we actually have also three main features uh, on the database. We have here the explore um, function, which is um, probably the core of the website because it's here that you're able to visualize your data. We also have the contribute feature, which is also uh, very important because, as I just said, um, we need people to contribute their data as much as possible to make this database grow and be, be more useful for the community. And finally, uh, the search uh, feature is also very important because I mean, browsing through the database is uh, one of the, the, the key things we want uh, people to do. So let's start with the uh, the search tool. So if we stay on the T4 example, uh, you can just type T4, of course, and then and it's like any other search engine. You're going to get a bunch of results, and you can use uh, some of filters uh, to limit the results. For instance, we can limit to viruses. I would know that T4 is a viruses, obviously. And then, as for pretty much uh, every, anything on the website, it's, uh, I think, super easy to use. You basically just click on something if you're interested and want to know more. So, I mean, if we click on T4, we're going to get uh, on a specific page uh, just for this virus, as you can see. Here. And then on this page, you have a few identifiers here, and here is the data. But let's start with the identifiers because um, <clears throat> when you make a database, uh, it's always a very important concern to precisely identify each uh, element of the database so everybody knows uh, what we are talking about, basically. And I think it's especially relevant for bacterial phage, where, I mean, even slight uh, variation, like you have mutants and all of these things, and we, we really want to know exactly what you're talking about. And to answer this problem, uh, in our case, we choose uh, to allow people to associate to their phage or bacteria uh, the, the gene bank record for this phage or bacteria because we think that if you have the sequence, you, that's a uh, precise enough uh, identification. So that's basically what is displayed here. And once again, you can click uh, on it to, to explore it. So for instance, uh, if we click on the if we click on the different tabs, you can see your access to the taxonomy, to the gene bank record. And also, we have the Felix Dara collection for all the, for all the collection of the Felix Dara reference center for bacterial viruses, sorry, on the database already. So we also have this uh, identifier, identifiers um, if you want to learn more about this stage. So basically, we um, this is a way to precisely uh, identify the members of the database. And now let's get to the to the data. So as you see, you have a table here with all the data sources which uh, have tested T4. And on the left, um, vertically, you have all the hosts that have been tested. And you can just basically scroll through to see all the hosts that have been tested um, with T4. And uh, the data is uh, displayed according to a tree value scheme. So we'll detail this later, but basically for now you can um, just uh, see that zero means that T4 cannot infect this host, or and two means that T4 can infect this host. So basically, yeah, you can just uh, browse through this, and once again, if you want to learn more, you can just um, click on a on, on element, 
and it will uh, show you this element. For instance, if we click on Nikolai K12, we get like a similar page for uh, this train, and we can see all the pages that it's in, are able to infect it, all the pages that have been tested. And similarly, you can click on uh, data, data sets to learn more about them and see the metadata, etc. For instance, uh, it's possible to associate um, publications to data. So you can once again click and you will get to like the, the publication and you're able to, to see that. Uh, the description is very important because that's where most of the metadata is going to be. Uh, and you can also see who deposited the data and we also have uh, an option uh, that you can use in order to contact uh, this person if you want to know more about the data or requesting for requesting a specific page or bacteria. So that's pretty much it for the search. I mean, there's nothing too fancy, but uh, it, it allows you to easily get, I think, the data you're looking for. Now we're going to go through the contribution process. Uh, something that is important to note about the contribution process is that you need to create an account to be able to contribute. So basically, you just need to give us your email address and name. That's, that's super easy. And the idea behind it is that, is that as you just saw, then we're able to link your data with your name and the email address is just useful if uh, there's some problem with your data and you need to contact us or if like another user is basically interested in, in your data and wants to contact you. So I'm just uh, going to log in and then we'll be ready to contribute. So um, about the contribution process, we wanted to make it as easy as possible. And uh, what we chose to do is uh, that since we know that most people uh, will often uh, keep this sort of data in Excel uh, files, we made a process that is uh, super easy to do if you have an Excel file. So <clears throat> I have here an example of such a file. So once again, it's a T4 with a bunch of Nikolai's. And the only thing that you need to make sure uh, is that to have your uh, bacteria, written horizontally and your page written vertically because that's like how it's going to work on the afterwards. So if you have such a file, uh, it should be easy, super easy to, to contribute. It should be directly compatible. So let's go through it. So first you have to give a name, of course, so we can just put a face. And uh, even though I've been talking a lot about uh, making the data public and so that like anyone can see it and there's all this application, etc. Uh, we can you we also allow for you the possibility to keep your data private. And if you choose to do that, uh, absolutely no one will be able to see it, uh, not even I or any other administrator of the website. However, if you do this, uh, you will still be able to share it with the uh, other uh, user of the database. So this can be very useful if you're working on a project and you want to take advantage of uh, of this database to analyze your data or whatever, but you don't, I mean, you don't want to send it to everyone yet and you want to keep it private, it's completely fine. And even if you do that, you can still share it with the collaborator. So I think it can be useful in some cases. So let's keep going. Now we get to this uh, description part, which uh, we just saw earlier. And once again, it's just about uh, putting as much uh, metadata as possible. And we don't ask for uh, that much during the contribution process, but we want people to rigorously enter uh, the data here, like uh, mostly the methodology, so people can understand uh, where the data is coming from and the origin of the strain, et cetera. So that's basically it. Um, you can associate a publication if you want. You just have to like pass, pass the link here, but obviously it's not mandatory. And now we're almost already ready to uh, upload our file. So as I said earlier, I just need to make sure as it's shown on the right here to have your uh, host bacteria written uh, horizontally and your page uh, vertically. Uh, to click. And now if we go, we just have to choose our file from our computer, upload it. And now we get to a final step, which is also a very important step. So uh, as I said earlier, uh, the data when we were looking at T4 data was displayed with uh, this three value scheme. 
And the reason behind this uh, three value scheme is because um, we want, as I said in, to, in the introduction, to be able to compare different uh, data from different people and from all over the world, really. But the thing is that um, not everyone uh, scores uh, their O strange data the same way. Some people will just use like an on off with two value system. Some people will have three values with an intermediate values. Some people will have five values. Some people will use efficiency of flexing values. So there's really a lot of ways you can uh, do, do that. And that prevents us uh, then to easily compare and uh, combine this data after. So what we choose to do is that all the data on the website uh, is using this three value scheme. So then when it's in the database, any, any data that is in the database use it. So you can easily compare them together. And basically, this step is here so that um, you don't have to, uh, on your data, use uh, adapt it to our system. Basically, it's a step where your you map your values that you are using to our three value scheme. So, for example, uh, in the example I showed you, uh, I was using the value, the value 0, 1, 2, and 3 in my table. So they are here. And now it's up to me to choose how I want to uh, assign them to each of the three values that uh, are on the database. So for instance, uh, I can choose to put one and two in the intermediate uh, category and three for infection and zero for no infection. Or maybe uh, in my scoring system, I believe that the one and two uh, doesn't actually report an actual infection. So I want to put them in the no infection uh, value. And for instance, I don't want to use this intermediate value. It's completely fine. It's really a step where you, you can adapt your data to our uh, three value scheme. So <clears throat> once we're uh, done with that, we'll basically uh, finish the contribution process. So uh, as you saw, it was pretty, uh, pretty fast. And um, <clears throat> Something that is worth noting also is that you can at any time update uh, this information. For instance, uh, if you were doing the, if you are, uh, having this data source as a private uh, data and now you want to make it public because it's published, well, you can like, pass the publication and just click to make it public and it will be uh, updated right away. And similarly, uh, I've said that the NCBI, and NCBI identifier are super important uh, to be able to precisely identify uh, the elements of the database. So this, you don't have to add them right away. You can add them later. For instance, if you didn't sequence your fade or your bacteria yet, well, you can add them later. It's completely fine. So we are going to do this for T4, for instance. Uh, you can you just have to pass the, the identifier, click save, and it's going to be incremented right away. So it's super easy to import and, and manage data. So that's pretty much it for the contribution process. And now we're going to go to the last and uh, more exciting part of uh, exploring the data. So if we click here, we're going to go to this uh, explore function I was uh, talking about earlier. And you can see sort of a similar table that we had uh, before with T4, just that now the bacteria are going to present uh, to be present uh, horizontally, and the phage are going to present, be present vertically, pretty much as our uh, Excel file. So I mean the data is displayed, and then you have like a number of things that you can do to to play around with it. Uh, on the tab, you have three. On the top, you have three tabs: uh, data source, various, and both, which are basically to select the data you want to display. So, for instance, if you want to limit uh, to display only the page number one and two, you can just uh, choose to do so. Uh, it's a bit slow, but it should be good. Yeah. Uh, and more importantly, uh, you can add other data. Uh, so, oops, I think that it's a bit maybe we just reload it. Okay, we're back on it. So, and more importantly, uh, yeah, if you want to add um, other data sources, so for instance, you want to compare two of your data sources, or you want to compare it with like uh, other data from all over the world, you can just go on the data tab and then we'll stay on, the, on this T for example. And if we type T4, well, we see that there's this uh, 
interesting data, data source that's interesting, and you basically just have to click. And uh, it should be, and it will merge it right away. Oops, oh, that's not good. Whoa. Of course. Uh, <laughs> Okay, let's go back. Sorry for that. Of course, when you show something online for the first time, it's always going to crash. So let's go back to our data source and try to add the, the one with C4. Okay, now it's good. Um, so yeah, sorry for that. And um, yeah, basically you can see that uh, right away, you're going to get a combination of, of both table. It should just say both uh, right away is going to combine to merge them, which, as I said in the introduction, is a very convenient way to analyze such data. And something uh, you might notice is like this top left uh, cell here is uh, highlighted in black. And that's because um, there's actually a discrepancy here. So if we click on this particular cell, we're going to see that uh, the response for this particular um, data say that uh, this interaction it scores it scores it with the value two, but our data set we score it with the value zero. So you can uh, super easily um, notice such uh, discrepancies between data sets with our tool, and I think which is uh, helpful when you want to merge uh, data. And um, so now we can also uh, try to go a bit further with this data than just look at it, uh, than just looking at it with using some of the tools. And the main tool we, are, we offer is what we call the infection ratio. And that's basically uh, this number that you can see here, um, which uh, is for the bacteria the number of phage uh, that can infect it. So, for instance, uh, in this case, for K12, it's going to be quite high because there's a lot of phage that can infect it. And for this other E. coli, it's going to be zero because uh, no phage can infect it. So, basically, the higher, the more susceptible the thing. And uh, we also have a similar value for the phage, where the higher it will be, basically, the broader uh, the host range of the phage will be. So that's already, I think, a useful uh, tool. But you can also choose to uh, organize uh, and order your data according to these values. So for instance, you can uh, very easily uh, see which uh, of your uh, phage has the highest source range, or which is the most or less susceptible bacteria, or do these sort of things. So uh, basically, uh, you can see that it's very easy to uh, display data and then play around with it, add other data, uh, combine it, see if there's discrepancies, uh, see very quickly in two clicks which is the most uh, efficient phage, for instance, or the most resistant bacteria. All of this you can do, you can do in, in few seconds. And I just want to add that uh, if you did all of this process and you want to share it or save it, it's super easy because basically the the link is updated uh, every time you change something, you change the parameter, it's updated. So you can just copy it or click on the share button and copy it. And if, if you open it again in a new tab, it's going to show you exactly the same data as you as you were seeing it. So it's uh, very easy this way to, to save it or share it. And you can also save it uh, in an Excel uh, spreadsheet if you prefer. So that's pretty much it for the main functionality of the database. And I want to say that there's also documentation that you can use if you have uh, more questions. Now we can go back to the slide for a quick uh, conclusion. So <clears throat> I hope that I showed you that the very awesome database is a good way for you to first of all, like get this uh, quick access to the this source range data you might be looking for. I think it's a very convenient way to store and manage your strength data because the visualization is going to be much easier than just using Excel. Um, we do have some, to be honest, simple tools, but I think that they can make your life easier when you're working with such data. And we also offer you the ability to compare your data with data from uh, all, anyone from the community. And as I said in the introduction, I think it's also a good way to I increase the knowledge that we have in the community and uh, maybe develop some future applications. 
So uh, as you saw, the website is, uh, is working. Um, anyone can access it nowadays with the, with the address. And uh, it's, a, it's already been published also. We already have quite uh, a lot of data, more than 700 viruses and almost uh, 1,700 hosts. But we're really waiting now for more people to contribute with their data so then we can keep making this database grow and be more and more relevant. And I want to say that for this process, uh, we're really here to help you. If you have any problem, you can, your, you can feel free to contact us to tell us and we'll help you through it. And also, if you have uh, any feedback, any idea while using it, um, then, we can, then you can also feel free to contact us. And then, I mean, we'll be super happy to read it and to try to uh, make this tool uh, more and more uh, useful for the community. To finish, I want to thank all the people behind this uh, project. So, of course, my boss, uh, Laurent de Barbieu, but also Brian Brancott, which uh, actually did all the web design and web development. So, big thanks to him, as well as to uh, Hervé Ménager, which also helped in this regard. And I also want to thank uh, all the people that already contributed with uh, their data on our database. And finally, I want to thank uh, Jessica for the introduction and uh, you for your attention. And I will be happy to hear your questions. Thank you so much, Quentin. That was amazing. Thank you. Like, perfect. Amazing. Really good. We're, we're going to get everyone here to submit a data set. And that, that's the least we can do. <laughs> So um, let's go through the questions. I'll do the ones that are in the chat and then maybe we'll have time to call on some people who might wanna ask them via voice if you wanna raise your hand, um, but we might, we'll see, we'll see how we go. So we have a question from uh, Phage Director, which is Jan. Um, could you please go into more detail about the numerical values 01 and two? When is it clearly an infection? When is it intermediate? Is there a grading and scoring system? Maybe you touched on this, but yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a very good question that I get asked a lot because I think it depends really how do you usually uh, manage such data yourself. As I said, there's really, uh, we, we noticed that there was really uh, a lot of ways. Some people use numbers, some people put plus, minus, etc. But basically, the idea for us is that, of course, you're going to have no infection and you're going to have uh, like this infection or infection values. But we noticed that so many people had this sort of intermediate values that uh, we wanted to keep this information uh, some in, in some way uh, without getting too complex. So basically, this intermediate value is going, just going to show that uh, maybe it worked, but the, the EOP is not very uh, satisfactory. So it might be infecting this strain, but not efficiently at all. Or in other cases, it might be like a weird plate phenotype or something like that. So I agree that it's not a, this intermediate value. Like if you take a very theoretical, uh, like rigorous theoretical mindset, it doesn't mean anything because I mean, the fact it does not infect or does not infect, but it's just to reflect like the, the data people have to show a bit more complexity. But once again, you, you don't have to use it as I show in the example. Like if you say, ah, I don't want to use it, you don't have to use it. It's just a possible possibility to use it. Uh, I hope that answers your question. But that, that basically is like this. no infection, infection. And then if you have like something in between, you can use these values, but you don't have to. Awesome. Yeah. Um, OK, another question from Jan. Do you provide API access? Uh, not right now, I think, but that's definitely some of the things we can uh, work on. Um, yeah, no, I, I don't think it would be possible right now, um, but uh, I mean, that's something we, we can work on for sure if people are interested. Awesome. From Tegan Brown, is there any curation of the bacterial strains to make these comparable across different labs? So that's of, of course also a very um, big issue that we we really, uh, try to we try to think it from the start. But of course, it's going to be uh, a main issue because, like, to imagine, some people are going to put like Erisha, Asia, Coli, K12. Some people are going to put like E. Coli, K12. Some people are just going to put K12. So that's why we. 
we don't like uh, we allow people to put the names like they want so that once again it's easy to import your data and then after we will uh, yes to answer the question there will be like some light curation for some of these things like if if I notice that uh, basically I get a notification every time someone like put some public uh, data source because due to the private one I don't see them and then I will check and if I see that like you put equal IK12 and you don't put a space between the point and which most other people do, then I will just correct it. And I will let you know, of course, but yeah, there will be some slight curation in this regard to uh, indeed make sure that then you can merge the data and everything. Cool. Yeah. Um, all right, let me see. Does this database is from Edison Cano. Does this database consider genomic data? Well, um, I'm not really sure about the, uh, this question, but basically, as you saw, you we really encourage people to add the, the gene bank record associated to their various keys or host uh, when they have it. So I think that's a way to like, and as you saw, it's super easy. You basically click and click on it, and you get direct access to the data. So I would say that um, we try to integrate it, this genomic data, but again, I'm not sure about the question. So feel free to, to detail it. Yeah, feel free to add it. clarity, Edison. Um, okay, do you have any insight on how labs are producing the phage host interaction values, plaque assays, optical density, and do you have a suggestion for the best way to get this information in a high throughput way? Uh, I think, I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm not really an expert on like this experiment. Like I did some myself, but I'm not like the, the biggest expert for that. But uh, what I saw is that most people do some sort of spot assay. But I mean, there's also really a variety of ways to do it. Like some people will do it in liquid, in solid, etc. So I mean, for me, it's a bit difficult to to know. And that's really the sort of information that I want that people put in the description section we saw. So then maybe you, you're going through data and you see like, oh, actually, like this guy found that this interaction work and this other guy found that this interaction doesn't work. And then you can look and maybe some guy tested it like on a plate and some people test it on liquid. And I think that's, uh, yeah, that's a very valuable information, but we don't really want to limit that. And myself, I don't really have uh, any opinion on like which would be the best way, I think it's all very page dependent. So, and I'm not sure about uh, the suggestion for the best way to get this information in a high throughput way. Um, I'm not sure what you mean. This, you mean like uh, high throughput like outside of the, from our database to outside or I'm not really sure. Um, I'll let Jan clarify if you want to, Jan. Yeah. Um and we'll go to the next one yeah um okay um from piotr tunetsky wonderful work are you planning to introduce phage host matching service into the platform and um a sequence based or ai aided phage host uh, yeah that, that's a very good question uh that was sort of uh, the thing that i was thinking when i was talking the introduction about the uh, like all the basically the application you can imagine with this sort of data. And of course, I know that's a very hot topic to currently like this host uh, fed host machine. But uh, ourselves, we're not really interested in doing uh, those things ourselves, first of all, because we don't really like have the background to do such things. But uh, we really, I mean, so we're not going to do it ourselves. But if like anyone is interested to like uh, use this data or do I, like yeah, use this data in, in any way to power some sort of uh, yeah prediction or any, any sort of application would be uh, more than happy to, to allow it or to work with these people if we can your help. Awesome. <clears throat> um, for Marianne Keith, thanks, Quentin. Looks great. I think it's really helpful that you encourage people to also write the description of exactly how they have isolated their phage at the lab bench so that this is also shared. Just a helpful comment. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Um, from Pranav and Apurva, very interesting presentation, Quentin. Thank you. Yeah, lots of people saying an awesome resource. Um, 
Okay, from Helmut von Schmidt, can you describe the scoring more? Seems like the backbone of the database, the database may be only as good as the accuracy of the scores. Yeah, so I think more or less what I already said earlier to the, the question about like here, the, the system. So once again, it's just like, uh, does the fetch work, does it not work? And you have this intermediate values to report like maybe a lower efficiency or because I mean, a lot of people like they have EOP data. So that's a way to like integrate like this more fine, fine tuned data in the, in the database. And once again, I think you, like uh, I didn't show all the functionalities of the web of the website, but uh, you can basically disregard this intermediate values if you're not interested, and basically just have this on up system that you can trust if you, if you prefer. So I agree that it's really the backbone of the website. It really is this uh, skin that allows us to to compare the data, and at the end, it's really impact doesn't infect, so it doesn't get much simpler than that. I think. Awesome. Okay, we have a clarification from Edison. Um, he says he was the one who asked about the genome data. So if he had a whole genome of a clinical isolate, could he search for a phage that would infect that isolate using this data? Ah, okay. Uh, that's a good question. So obviously you cannot like search with uh, genome information right away, but if you, for instance, um, let, so let's say this, this is a like, very well-known uh, isolate that it's already on gene bank. And let's say I already deposited data using the gene bank. You can basically use the search tool that I showed earlier. You can like paste your uh, gene bank identifier and you will find the strain. So you just click on it and then you can see what's been tested on the strain. So you can, you, I didn't detail this, but the search tool is basically searching everything. So if I put uh, Quentin, I will find my data. If I put a spot test, I will find all the description with spot test. If I put the gene bank identifier, I will be able to find the, the strain that has the gene bank identifier. So yeah, basically you if you have a sequence and you want to know if for this particular strain there's some data, you can just paste it and and look at it. That's awesome. Uh, cool. Okay. A couple more um, from Svenja Lassen. Sorry if I got your name wrong. Thank you for the presentation. Does the platform distinguish between methods used? I think we touched on this, but um, yeah, may not assume to determine infectivity. Does it distinguish? So yeah, you were saying you kind of reduce it down to a zero, one, two, so that all these methods can be compared. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. And then again, I really, really want people to like put this in the the description of the data source. So then. As you saw, you just basically on this website click on stuff and learn more. And like if you say like, oh, maybe this was surprising or whatever, you click and you say, ah, they did a different method or it, I like the philosophy behind this website is really just to put the data out there and it's up to you to decide what you trust, what you don't trust. We have some some like you can only trust for instance the data that has some ncbi identifiers i i didn't show it but we have some filters to like only show the data that have these identifiers and stuff like that so and i think it's up to you to yeah go check and see what you want to consider and what you do you think is not uh, good. awesome and okay last one in the chat would you please explain what n1 means what is an intermediate okay Maybe you touched on this too, but clearly people are zeroing in on this, which is great. Yeah, I know, I know. I mean, I already, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's the, like the top one remark people have, because like, as I said, like if you, yeah. if you are very rigorous on this, like this doesn't mean anything. So I, I understand that some people are back there because like you have these values that basically doesn't mean anything. But once again, it's more to reflect like a case where you have uh, more complex data than just, uh, infect doesn't infect and if you want to reflect that maybe this page works but not so well because like yeah if you ask people like uh, does this page kill this train and but actually it's like the op is like really too loose some people will say it doesn't work but actually it works and maybe since it works you can evolve it or something so i think in some case it's good to have this information uh, this intermediate information but once again it's up to you to when you first, when you contribute data, you don't have to use it if you don't like it. And also when you post data, you can also disregard this value. So 
it's really not uh, something we impose. It's just more a possibility if you're interested. In it. So, for instance, if you can imagine a bacteria where there's like no two values, but there's a couple of one value, well, that's the information that maybe in this page are like interacting in some ways, even though like for you it will not be clear at all. And I want to add also that uh, on the description, it's also good if you can explain how you map the data. So for instance, you can say my value like one corresponds to this, then it can be more clear for the people. So that can be a, a way also to, to give more background to this uh, intermediate value if people explain it all the like data attribution. But yeah, I, I understand it's, a, it's a, it can be a bit weird. Or uh, when you when you just see that. Yeah, no, that's awesome. So for people who want to submit, it's open. It's ready to receive submissions now. You said, is um, <laughs> is any data set too small? Can they add like one page, one host, and that's great? Or what are you? What would you say to people who are thinking of submitting? No, really, anything is good. Like I think I already have a couple of people that just put like their page and their bacteria, and I think it's completely fine. Um, of course, then it's not super helpful for you to, like, uh, as I stated, I think the, the website is also useful to, like, compare big data sets. So this will, you will not have. But if anyone is looking for, like, uh, this information, and now they have it. So I think it's already super valuable. Uh, to have it, it's like the, like the, this Felix Derel collection that we have. Like, it's not usual data because they didn't test, like, all the phage against all the strain. But we still have this information of all these couples. So I think it's super valuable because I mean that's still information, and the more you have, the, the better it is. So no, there's no limit on the size. It can be one or two page or hundred, it doesn't matter. Wonderful. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Quentin, for taking your time to explain this to us. And we'll make it immortal on our YouTube page <laughs> until you tell us to take it down. Um, and so people can come back and when they're ready to deposit, get a refresher. So that's super awesome. Um, I wanna share my screen quickly before we go to breakout rooms to talk about the next faves before people leave if they're leaving. Um, so can you guys see my screen right now? Quentin? Yeah, I can see it. Cool. Uh, yes, yeah, so do you want me to, yeah. Yeah, I think I replaced your screen. So this is our next one. Just want to quickly show, and then we're going to do our breakout rooms. Um, so Rob McBride is going to be faves speaker number 18. And this is in a few weeks, uh, June 8th, so 5 p.m. Pacific. And this kind of ties in nicely with this one, because he's going to talk about using machine learning to design phages with enhanced therapeutic features. So for all you AI machine learning people and people looking at the phage data and how you can learn from it, maybe we should see you with this one. So come ask your questions there. So stop sharing that. Now I'm going to stop the recording.